certainly been a joy to be here with you today, and uh, uh, it's been a blessing to see, as I said this morning, uh, folks that have been here for many, many years, appreciate your faithfulness, and uh, that's becoming a, a rare, more and more rare thing, and uh, then also I appreciate, and it's exciting to see some new faces, and that tells me that you're reaching folks, and I'm so thankful for that, and I always enjoy uh, being around your pastor and his family, uh, your pastor and I, we go way back, and I, I'll tell you this, uh, he, uh, he has from the, the get-go, uh, he has been a man of great character, and uh, you are very blessed to have a pastor like Pastor Teak, and I, I'm not just saying that, I mean that with all of my heart, um, he is, uh, you are just very blessed. There's, uh, things have changed a lot in my lifetime as far as what I see going on in, in churches and so forth. And uh, one of the things is, uh, uh, is this thing here. I've got an iPad here, and this thing's trying to talk to me. And, uh, but anyway, um, whenever I, when I got out of college, there was an abundance of young men that were just willing to go and preach anywhere. We would pay you to let us preach for you. That's not the case anymore. And uh, back then there were more young men going to the ministry than there were churches. But now it's just the opposite. There's a lot more churches than there are young men. Uh, the gentleman that was uh, filling in for me today, Brother Jim Harrison, uh, he uh, was the moderator of our Mid Middle Georgia Preachers Fellowship for, I guess, about 18 years. And he is very familiar with the circumstances in the Middle Georgia area. And I was listening to him he, uh, this afternoon, uh, the sermon he preached this morning, did a great job, and he said that there were eight churches in our fellowship that were looking for pastors. Sorry, and, I don't know who your wife is. In fact, I don't okay. know who you are. Okay, okay, all right, so, all right, so, um, well, okay, uh, strange things happening around here today, aren't they, yeah, so, uh, but, uh, but anyway, one of, them is the church, one of them is the church that he pastored for about 30 years. One of them is that, is that particular church there. And uh, so, um, anyway, let me see, see here. This thing will sure mess you up, just to sure. I was thinking this morning, I said that usually whenever I preach, I, I put my notes on, a, on an iPad, but I usually have a, a paper copy in my pocket just in case the iPad lets me down. And this morning, I didn't have paper copies, and I thought, now what's this thing let me down? It's never done that before. And then the lights went out, and I thought, well, I'm glad I don't have a paper copy. I've got a, something to light up for me, but the lights came back on. And then this morning, I heard that gro growling, you know, and I said, you know, is that my stomach or is that yours? And I didn't know what was going on. I honestly thought, I, I've heard baptistries before that have a little bit of water in the bottom, and that last bit of water drain out, and it'd go that gurgle, gurgle, gurgle. I thought that's what was going on. And after the service, they were telling me that the screen went down and went back up. I had no idea what it was, all right? So uh, uh, anyway, it's, uh, you never know what's going to happen in the church, do you? You never know what's going to happen. All right, 2 Kings chapter 4. I, I preached this morning on God's blessings on a, a poor lady who supported a missionary. And I want you to understand that though it was a poor lady, you could apply that to a poor man or anybody else. And I want to speak this afternoon on God's blessings on a wealthy lady who supported a missionary. And uh, again, you could apply this to a man as well, but it just so happens in both these cases that these were ladies. And I want to say this, I appreciate the part that ladies play in the work of God. Amen. You look at the life of the Lord Jesus and you'll find that women were very important to his ministry. And you look at the life of the Apostle Paul and others and you'll find that there were women who were very important to their ministries. And... Uh, that's been my experience over the years, is that the ladies have really been very important to the ministries. Now, I thank God for men, and it troubles me that in so many cases we don't have men that are willing to step up and uh, take the leadership that they should. But I'm always thankful for good godly women uh, that are supportive of ministries, not only financially, but they get in there and they work hard, they do all kinds of things. It can be cleaning a building, it can be preparing meals, so many things, and I thank the Lord for ladies. Now, I want to read 2 Kings chapter 4. We're going to begin reading at verse 1. And uh, the Bible says this, now there, now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, 
And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more, and the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God and said, Go sell the oil and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. Now I just read that to give you a little bit of background uh, to what's going on here. But what I really want to dwell on is begins at verse 8. And there the Bible says, And it fell on the day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as often as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which passeth by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick. And it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. And it fell on a day that he came thither, and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi his servant, Call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he said unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is it to be done for thee? Wouldest thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among mine own people. And he said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Verily, she hath no child, and her husband is old. And he said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door, and he said, About this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, Nay, my lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. And the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her, According to the time of life. Please bless, Lord, the preaching of thy word. Please fill me with your spirit. Help me to think clearly, to speak simply, plainly. Please use me to be a blessing to the people. Oh, dear Lord, I pray that the people would listen not only with curious minds, but with hungry hearts and responsive hearts. The, saying already, Lord, you speak to me and I'll respond. I'm not here to wrestle with you. I'm here because I need to hear from you. And I know, Lord, if we'll all do that, that, Lord, you'll do some special things in our lives. I, some will be small things, some will be great things, but you'll work in lives here tonight, and that's what we want. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, the prophet that, I, I, uh, the, uh, that was in the message, the topic of the sermon this morning, was the prophet Elijah. And this evening, it is his successor, Elisha. Uh, I used to have a big problem keeping them straight in my mind, which one was first. Uh, but you look at them in alphabetical order, and that's the way they are, okay? Uh, so tonight we're talking about his successor, a man by the name of Elisha. Now, from my scripturally informed impressions of these two men, they were different. Uh, in fact, they were very different. Their dispositions, their ministry, they're just, they're, they, they were hardly nothing alike. And yet, the Lord used both of these men in a great way. Now, that's something we need to learn. I, that we need to realize I, that God does not limit who He uses to men of one specific type, to men of one personality, to men that have gone to one particular school, I, to men that, that have a, a, a particular style of preaching. But God uses a variety, a variety of men. I, he uses different men in different places and at different times to do His work. And if we do not realize that, we will be guilty of, and I fear 
In fact, I know that in our independent fundamental Baptist circles, we have been very guilty of the carnality that was displayed by the Corinthians who formed contentions, uh, contentious fract uh, factions around preacher personalities. I know that because I look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, 1, and I look here at verses 10 and following, and the Apostle Paul writing the Word of God says this to them, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and uh, that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, now listen here, this is where the, the contentions were, uh, a little contentious factions were forming, how they were forming. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, now everybody in the church was guilty of this. I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and then there were some that were real super spiritual, and I of Christ. Now you see what they're doing? Everybody in that church had picked their favorite preacher. And uh, these men were as different as night and day. Uh, Paul uh, certainly was, uh, he, I, in my mind, I picture him as not a very impressive looking man. Uh, probably had an eye disease that made him look rather repulsive. Uh, Apollos would have been a more uh, uh, eloquent man. People, some would have liked his preaching. Cephas, why well, he would have been, you know, he was the old fisherman, Simon Peter. I imagine he was just rough in his preaching there. And uh, they were forming these factions around these men. And the Bible says that's just being carnal. And I'm afraid that we have been very, very guilty of that. Now here we have Elijah and Elisha, two great men of God, greatly used of God. Uh, one trained by the other and succeeding the other. And yet, as you study their lives, you'll find that they were very, very different men. And I'm glad God does things that way. Amen? Yeah, I'll tell you what, I'm glad every preacher's not like me. I'm glad of that. I, and uh, I was thinking of it this afternoon along these lines. Uh, uh, Brother Colter here, he and I, we are a lot different. I'll tell you what, uh, he's young, handsome, uh, got, that, got that, you know, that, uh, that bombastic voice there and so forth there. And uh, here I am, old, wrinkled, gnarled, gray, and uh, so forth there. Now, I'm just, you know, nothing wrong with smiling, okay? And I've often said this, if you can't laugh at yourself, something's wrong with you, all right? I don't mind, uh, you know, uh, uh, providing a laugh for somebody. I enjoy doing that. But um, what I want you to see is God uses all different kinds of men. And I'm so thankful, I'm so thankful that he does. And that's what's happening here in the case of Elisha. Uh, greatly used, like his predecessor, but he is a different type of, of person here. Now, both Elijah and Elisha fit the description that I gave this morning of what a missionary is. Uh, they both, they went wherever the Lord uh, had uh, dictated that they go. Uh, they went whenever the Lord dictated that they go. And they always went with the message that the Lord had dictated. They didn't come up with their own message. It was thus saith the Lord, and that's the message they delivered. And that's what a missionary does. He goes wherever the Lord sends him, whenever the Lord sends him, with the message that God's given to him, which is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what he does. So in this sense, these men, both of these men were uh, missionaries. Uh, now, in the case of Elijah, we saw this, that the Lord used a poor widow to meet his need of shelter and food. And we saw that as a result of that, that the Lord blessed her by meeting her dire needs. This woman, boy, her needs were great. Just, a, just a, enough meal here. All I've got, I'm just going to gather two sticks and I'm going to make a little cake here and, and my son and I, we're going to eat it and then we're going to starve to death. I, she is in bad, bad condition when we think about materialistically wise. Very bad condition. But because that she obeyed the leadership of the Lord, and I think that's important to emphasize, she did what the Lord had said to do. And because of that, uh, the Lord blessed her by meeting her needs. Now, this evening, in the case of Elisha, the Lord did not meet his needs through a poor widow lady, uh, though the Lord did use Elisha to meet the needs of a poor widow. That's why I read the first eight verses there, uh, seven or eight verses there. Uh, the Lord used Elisha to meet the need of a poor widow lady. In this case, it was the widow of a prophet. 
And uh, there she was. She had children and so forth. And they were, you know, about to basically have everything they had repossessed. And the Lord used Elisha to meet her needs. But he did not use her to meet Elisha's needs. Unlike Elijah, uh, Elisha uh, was a man that did not have to live in hiding. If you study the life of Elisha, uh, of course he goes before the, the king, King Ahab, and he says, you know, it's not going to rain till ever I say it is, and that's because the Lord had told him to say that. And then he goes into hiding for three and a half years. And much of his life was spent uh, basically uh, hiding and running for his life and so forth there. But now King Ahab has died. And uh, Elisha has succeeded Elijah, and uh, he has a much better relationship uh, with the new king, a man by the name of Jehoram. He was the, the son of King Ahab, but apparently Elisha has somewhat of a good relationship with King Jehoram, uh, much more so than Elijah had, had with his father. And uh, because of that, he did not have to go in hiding. In fact, from what we can gather about Elisha's ministry is uh, Elisha had a circuit uh, used to be in our country, you had old circuit riding preachers, and they would just go from town to town to town. They had a circuit uh, where they'd preach. They didn't have preachers in all these towns and so forth, so they'd go to these little towns and preach. And that's kind of how Elisha seems to be. He has a circuit uh, that, he, that he goes on. He's not having to go in hiding. And because of that, Elisha's needs were not as great as Elijah's had been. Elijah, Elijah's out in hiding. He, he's got to have every bite of food provided to him by somebody, a raven, a widow, or somebody. Uh, but Elisha is obviously not like that. In fact, Elisha had a servant that traveled with him. He's mentioned here, a man by the name of Gehazi. And he traveled with him as he traveled his circuit, delivering the message of God to the, to the people. And so, in my mind, this man Elisha, uh, he, is, he is, from a, a worldly standpoint, he is in much better financial condition than his predecessor Elijah was. He's got a servant with him. He's traveling around. He's not having to go into hiding. I can imagine that he had love offerings and so forth uh, as he traveled and, and carried out his ministry. But as he traveled his circuit, uh, he goes through the area of Shunem. And the Bible tells us here that there was a great woman in Shunem. Now look at verse, chapter 4, 2 Kings chapter 4, and look at verse 8. It fell on a day that Elisha passed uh, to Shunem where was a great woman. So here's this great woman here in the, in the land of Shunem. And by great woman, I understand that she was obviously a woman of a financial means. Uh, she had money. Uh, she had her own home. She wasn't worried about starving to death. I've, everything I read in the story uh, indicates that she had a husband that was a hardworking, good provider for her. I don't know that the husband was saved. I don't know that. I don't, I don't see anything... That, uh, to really indicate it, uh, but at least he was a hard-working man, whether he knew the Lord or not. Uh, but she's a great woman. She has plenty of, 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 uh, of the world's goods. And uh, uh, that was unlike, unlike this woman that had provided for Elijah. Now, as he's going through Shunem, we find that this great woman, the Bible says that she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither, to eat bread. And I could imagine that he uh, enjoyed that. I could imagine if he got up one morning and said, thought to himself, wonder where I should go today. <laughs> Don't have any real definite impression where I ought to go. I think I'll go to Shunem. I know I'll get a good meal over there. All right. I'm speaking as a Baptist preacher now. All right. And, uh, but he, I'm sure he liked going through there because he knew that anytime he went there, that this woman, as oft as he did, and I think he probably went often, uh, that there was going to be a good home-cooked meal uh, prepared uh, for him there, something he probably did not get all that, uh, all that often. Now, when I think about this woman uh, here, this woman of Shunem, this great woman, uh, it reminded me of a woman in the New Testament. As I talked about the widow woman this morning, I, I kept thinking about that poor widow that cast in all that she had, and I referred to her a couple of times. But when I think about this woman here, a woman of means, I think about a woman that's mentioned over in the book of Acts chapter 16. And in Acts chapter 16, we have here, uh, we're introduced to a woman uh, that is a woman of means. Her name is Lydia. And I want you to notice what happens here. I was talking this morning how the missionary, the Apostle Paul, he received the Macedonian call. He went over to Macedonia. He goes there to the city of Philippi, uh, which was there in the region of Macedonia. And uh, when he goes there, 
I, one of the first uh, things he does is he finds these people that are worshiping down by the river and he ends up uh, leading some of them to the Lord. And one of them is this woman by the name of Lydia. Now look at Acts 16 verses 14 and 15. It says, And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira. So here's a woman and she's apparently got her own business. She's doing good, making a good living. And it says, which worship God, heard us. Now she's worshiping the Lord, but she doesn't really know the gospel. She doesn't know who the Lord is. And uh, so she's got this, this hunger in her heart, uh, but she doesn't know who the Lord is. And the Bible says, whose heart the Lord opened, and she attended unto the things that were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, now get this, she besought us saying, if ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. She put pressure on us. She wasn't going to take no for an answer. That's the way this woman is over here in 2 Kings chapter 4. I tell you what, a church is blessed if you've got somebody that just wants to open their home and their hearts up uh, to preachers and missionaries uh, that are coming through. A church is very blessed. I know whenever I was pastoring Alabama, I had a family like that in our church. It was a couple, they had had five sons, and they'd built a huge home. They lived downstairs, and upstairs it had five bedrooms, two bathrooms, a big rec room, a little study area, and so forth there. Even had a private entrance, you could come up from the outside, or you could go through the house uh, there. But it was understood, any time a missionary comes through, they're going to stay at our house, and they're going to feed them. They're going to feed them. And uh, they took good care of them. What a blessing. I can remember one time we had a missionary come through and he, he brought some others. He was out of Mexico and he brought some, uh, some Mexican nationals with him and just dropped in unexpectedly. And I thought to myself, well, I can't call these people at this last minute like this. I'm going to rent them a motel room. And I rented them a motel room. At that time, we didn't have a, a real nice motel in the whole town. We really didn't. But I put them in the nicest motel we had. And uh, Oh, my goodness, the man of the house, he heard about that. And uh, he called me up. He said, what do you think you're doing? You know any time a missionary comes through, they're going to stay at our house. I said, well, it came in at the last minute, and I just, he said, I'm going to check them out. And he went down there, and he checked them out, and he took them home. And they were glad that he did because, like I said, they took good care of them. That's just the way they were. That's the way they were. A church is blessed to have somebody like that. They're blessed. Uh, that can do that. Well, that's the way it was with Lydia. And uh, this is what this woman here, the spirit that she has about her. Now, uh, as, as she invites Elisha in, every time he comes by, she's constraining him to come in and have a meal with her. He knew there was always a meal there. But now here's an interesting thing. The better acquainted that she became with Elijah, the more convinced she was that he was a holy man of God. Look at verse 9. She said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is an holy man of God which passeth by us continually. Boy, what a testimony that man of God had. I, you know, I, I was uh, brought up in the day, I don't know how it is now with, with how preachers are, are trained and so forth, but uh, I, I, the way the old timers used to feel is this, you always keep your little distance between you and your people. Because if they get to know you too much, they'll lose respect for you. They'll see the flaws in your life. And the truth is, you know, all of us are human beings. We are. And we all do have our shortcomings and our flaws. And uh, it's part of spiritual maturity to understand that in each other, including the pastor, and the pastor to understand it as well. Uh, but that was the way you were taught. You always keep a little distance. You don't ever have any close friends in your church. You keep that distance there because if they become too familiar with you, they'll lose respect for you. And uh, that's the way that I was brought up and taught early, in the early days of the ministry. But oh my goodness, look at this. Here's a man, as often as he comes through, he goes into the home and, and he dines there at the home. And I can imagine she watched his demeanor. She watched the way he ate. Uh, she observed the way he talked. Uh, she observed his humor. She observed his seriousness, his conversation, his manners and all of that. And the more she got to know this man, the more she was convinced this is not simply a man of God. This is a holy man of God. What a testimony. And so she says to her husband, I perceive that this is a holy man of God. May God help all of us preachers and missionaries 
to have such a testimony before those uh, that get to know us uh, uh, intimately there. What a testimony he had. And uh, so anyway, she's con uh, convinced of that. And uh, as I said earlier, the more I read the story, I, I don't find anything indicating that her husband personally was a believer in the God of Elisha. He may or may not have been. If he was, I don't see anything to indicate that he had the same fervor for the Lord that she did. Uh, but he was, whether he knew the Lord or not, he was obviously a good, hardworking man. He was a good provider for her. He was obviously a moral man, and he was obviously a very generous man. Uh, uh, so uh, whenever she comes to him and she says, Now, I perceive this is a holy man of God. And then she says in verse 10, let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick, and it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. And I've got the word us, the little pronoun us underlined through there. She said, I, this is something we're going to do. We're going to do. She didn't just go say, let me do it. But uh, uh, she's got a little tactfulness about her. She knows how to approach her husband. And she says, let us, let us do this. And uh, uh, lo and behold, her husband, uh, he says, okay. He said, that's, uh, that's fine. Let's do that. Now, he obviously, he had a great respect for the Elisha himself. And he obviously had a great respect for the faith of his wife, whether he shared that faith or not. He obviously had a great respect uh, for her as well. And so he said, all right, let's do that. We'll add that little chamber on, what we would call a prophet's chamber. We'll add that onto our house. And any time the man of God comes by, he will have a place to, to rest. Not only will he have a good home-cooked meal, but he'll have a place to just turn in and sit down there and rest. Uh, we're we're going to have him a bed to rest on. We'll have him a table. We'll have him a candlestick to light it up there. And, and he can be in there. He can pray. He can study, uh, rest, whatever he needs to do. So they built this little chamber. Now, this little chamber, it, there was nothing really luxurious about it. But it did meet the, the needs of Elisha. And it was built just for him. This was not a guest room for any and everybody. This was just for this man of God that's coming through. And uh, it just had the basic needs in it. But here's something I noticed. Elisha was very thankful for them providing a room with just the basic needs in it. He was very thankful for that. In fact, you look down at verse 13. He says this about to her. He says, Behold, thou hast been uh, careful for us with all this care. Now, you look back in my mind, I look at this woman. She is a woman, uh, a, a, a great woman, a woman obviously that's very wealthy. I, I could imagine that uh, her, her husband, and he probably would have done it, she'd ask him, she'd say, listen here, let's build a big room onto the house. And, uh, and let's, let's, man, I tell you what, let's make it plush. Let's make it something that whenever he comes by, he won't ever want to leave. We're going to, man, we're going to have the nicest furniture in there. Uh, it is going to be the very best that money could buy. That man could probably have done that. But no, the wife said, let's just build him a little chamber and uh, just meet the basic needs. And this man of God, as he comes there and he sees that, he is very thankful for it. Now, I'm afraid that some men, that they would look at it like this. You know something? These folks got plenty of money. They could have built a nicer room than this. Uh, uh, they, could have, they could have put more than a candle in this room. Uh, why, uh, they, uh, she could have made a more comfortable bed for me here. They could have made two rooms so my, my, my servant could sleep in one and I'd have uh, more privacy. And uh, it would have been very easy to look at all that they could have done and say uh, they should have done more and not been thankful. But that was not the way it was. Uh, he was just thankful that God had touched their hearts and they had provided this little basic uh, place for him. And may I say to you, I, if you can't be thankful for the little things people do, you won't be thankful for the big things they do. Yeah, right. You need to learn to be thankful for the little things, and then the big things will come. Uh, but anyway, she makes this. And so one day he's up there in the room. I, I let my, I call it my sanctified imagination run with me in reading these old Bible stories. And I'm thinking about, you know, he probably uh, I went, stopped in there uh, unexpectedly, and I can see the little uh, Shunammite woman she says, oh, my goodness, preacher, I wasn't expecting you. Uh, listen here, uh, uh, let me fix you a meal. And I could just imagine her just rushing around and fixing him, you know, some collard greens and uh, started to say fat back, but no, she wouldn't have fixed him fat back. And, uh, uh, you know, I could just picture her fixing him some cornbread, stuff like that, all that good stuff and some good old sweet tea, you know, and all that. 
and just gave him a good meal. And oh, the prophet, you know, he's had a long walk and now his, his stomach's full. And he says, well, I'm going to go up to my little room and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to rest. And he goes up there and I can just imagine he lies back on that bed and he's lying there and he's thinking, I'm such a blessed preacher to have somebody that cares for me like this. I fed me this good meal and uh, got this nice little room for me to be in. And as he's lying there and he's thinking to himself about how blessed he is and how generous this family's been to him, he, this thought crossed his mind. He says, I wonder if there's anything I could do to express my gratitude to this little lady. And uh, so he sends his servant, Gehazi. He says, go get her. And Gehazi brings the woman up back up there uh, to his little prophet's chamber. And uh, Elisha asked her, he said, now, uh, what can I do to express my gratitude? Let you know how much I appreciate this. I know I've told you that, but what could I do? In fact, he might have been thinking in the back of his mind, he might have, you know, he might have had this carnal thought. Maybe the reason this woman did this for me is so because she had something she wanted to ask me to do. And, uh, and so uh, he says to her there in verse 13, he says, what is to be done for thee? Wouldst thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? Otherwise, I've got access to the, to the, the king. I, I can go to him and ask a favor. Is that, is that the reason you did this? And, and she said, no, no, I dwell among my own people. Preacher, I, I didn't do this because I wanted you to do me a favor. I, 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 I'm surprised you'd even think like that. This is my imagination running with me now, okay? Uh, that's not it. Well, I'm sure that eased his mind there, but he's still thinking. I would sure like to do something. She didn't do this in order to get me to uh, expect a, 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 a favor in return. But still, I'd like to do something. And so she's left, and he's thinking there. And he says, to, not just to his servant, he says, now Gehazi, he says, there's got to be something that we can do for this woman. Uh, certainly, we, there's, you know, uh, we don't have enough money. I mean, she's got enough money to buy anything she wants. And uh, so there's nothing we can get her, you know, that, that she needs. She's got all of that. But there's got to be something. There's got to be something that we can do uh, for this lady. And uh, Gehazi says, well, he said, I want to tell you something. He says, verily, she hath no child, and her husband is old. She has no child. Now, in that culture, she wanted a child uh, because a child, especially a male child, was very important to carry on the family name. And uh, if a woman in that culture did not have a child, especially a male child, then she was kind of looked down on. Maybe something's wrong with her. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe there's some sin in her life. And uh, I'm sure that she, she felt kind of bad that she had not been able to produce a son for her husband. And now he's getting up in age, and they have no children there. And so Gehazi says, well, she hadn't, hadn't, hadn't said this. He said, but I've noticed they don't have a child. And I, I, I'm sure that she would love to have a, a child. And uh, uh, so uh, he says, all right, I want you to go get her and bring her and have her come back. And they bring her up to, to the room. Now, I want you to see something here. This woman's got all this money, all this wealth. She doesn't want anything for the, from the king. But she's got a need in her life that the king couldn't even meet. The king couldn't give her a child. If she had said, yeah, I want you to go to the king and Tell him to give me a child. The king couldn't produce a, a child for her. He couldn't do that. Uh, so she's got something that even the king uh, could not give her. And so Gehazi brings her back up and they asked her. They said, now, uh, I understand you don't have a child. And again, I'm paraphrasing. I understand that. Uh, but uh, here's what he says. He says, about this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. That's what she says in verse, seven, uh, verse uh, 16. And lo and behold, she could not believe it. She said, Nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. This would be a dirty joke. No, please don't lie. Don't lie to me. But you know what? Look at the next verse, verse 17. And the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her according to the time of life. Now, if you would take time to read further in this story, and if you were to take time to compare it with a, I read further in the story that I, I preached from this morning, here's what you'd find. You'd find that both of these ladies, their children died. And you'd find that the Lord, uh, through the ministries of Elijah and Elisha, uh, brought those sons back to life. 
Now, that's not what I'm getting at tonight, but I just to get, maybe challenge you and uh, stir your interest up and you go and look at it yourself. A lot of interesting parallels here. But here's what I'm wanting you to see from, from, uh, from the stories of these two ladies who allowed the Lord to use them to meet the needs of His missionaries. And it's simply this, that God blesses those who meet the needs of His missionaries. God does. They are very special people to God. The missionaries are very special to the Lord. But those that meet the needs of the missionaries are very special to the Lord as well. Very, very special. Now, the need of the wealthy woman of Shunem, it was much different than the need of the poor woman of Zarephath, was it not? The woman of, Zer uh, the woman of Zarephath, her needs were material. She needed food to eat for her and her child. This woman out here of Shunem, uh, she's got plenty of money. She's got all anything she wants there. She can add a room onto the house for the preacher to, just for the preacher to stay in when he comes through. Uh, but you know something? This woman of Shunem, with all of her worldly goods, uh, she did not have what that poor widow of Zarephath had. The widow of Zarephath had a son. The woman of Shunem had, a, had all the things the widow of Zarephath didn't have. But because she took care of the man of God, God met the needs that she has. Now, here's the woman of Shunem. She's got all the stuff the widow of Zarephath did not have, but she does not have the one thing the widow of Zarephath did have. And that was a son. And that's what she wanted. I know, Elijah, you can't go talk to the king or anything. And what, you know, they couldn't help me. And uh, yet they perceived that what she really needed was a son. That was the empty void in her, in her life. And because she met the needs of God's man, uh, God met her need uh, by giving her a son. Now here's something I've discovered over the years. We, we so often we look and we see people that have material needs. And there are a lot of people out there that have material needs. I, you know, that don't have uh, decent incomes. A lot of them, uh, you know, they don't have the, the proper diets and so forth. There's a lot of that out there. There's a lot of that around the community that I live in there. A lot of it's self-induced, but not all of it is. Uh, a lot of times it's, uh, it may be because of poor health or something like that. There's a lot of needs out there, but we see these physical and material needs, and they're so obvious. They're so obvious to us. But I've been in the ministry for a while now, and here's something I discovered. I would say just about everyone, if not everyone, has a need that cannot be met with money. It cannot be met with money. Just about, if not everyone, has a void, an empty place in their life, some need that man, medicine, money cannot meet. It cannot meet. Only God can meet it. And that's what this dear lady has, a need that only God can meet. She wants a son. She doesn't even dare to ask the man of God I, about this. She figures, he could not help me. He's just a man. A man of God, but he could not help me. And yet, because that she ministered to the man of God, God gave her that which she did not have. He met that need in her life. Now, I, I, I do not believe that the Lord would have bargained with this wealthy woman. I don't believe that if she had come to the Lord and said something like this. Now, Lord, I tell you what. If you'll give me a son, I'll build a prophet's chamber for the, 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 the preacher coming through. And I'll feed him a meal every time he comes through. He'll always be welcome. If you'll give me a son. I don't believe the Lord would have given her a son. I hear people uh, talk about, you know, well, I promised God if he'd do this, I'd do that. And I'm thinking, well, that's not, you know, you're not in really a position to bargain with God. <laughs> you're not. You're not in a position to do that. I, I wouldn't do that if I was you. I wouldn't do that. I, I, and I doubt it very seriously if the Lord would have given her a son if she'd have tried to cut a deal uh, with the Lord. But I do know this. That because she, not, not because she was doing this to get God to do anything special for her, but she willingly and without any expectations, without any expectation of reward at all from the Lord, she just said, I want to help the man of God. And God met the need that she had dared not even express. And it may very well be that somebody's listening to me this evening. And there's a need in your life that your preacher doesn't know about. 
The people you work for or work around, they don't know about. Fam members of your clo fa close family and friends, they don't know about it. But there's a need in your life. There's a need in your life that only God can meet. Now, I can t I'm not going to guarantee you that if you give a bunch of money through faith promise that God's going to meet that need. But I can tell you this, based upon this example here, there's a little precedent set here. It may very well be that if you will just step out by faith and obey God in this thing, and give what he's leading you to give, that God will meet that need that you've not dared tell anybody else about. And I don't, I don't, I'm scared to even start speculating what the need might be because they'd be so, so varied. But God does something special for poor people and for rich people that take care of his men. He really does. He really does. And I trust God has used this to kind of help you tonight. I I, I looked at these two things. It's been months ago, these two ladies, and I just looked at them and I said, my goodness, such a contrast, but both of them were blessed by God because they took care of God's missionaries. Oh, my, how God blesses those that do. Preacher, you come, please. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If, I'm going to encourage each of you to come to the altar and pray. Just talk to the Lord about the faith promise. So if you want to come on, come on. And we have Brother Coulter to stand down here at the front. So that when you come from the altar, you can give him your faith promise. And look, if you don't have one, that's fine too. Come and pray. Um, but maybe you're here tonight and you say, Brother Justin, I'm lost. I don't even know Jesus Christ is my personal Savior. Just as you heard, you have a need that only the Lord can meet. No one else can save you. You can't save yourself. Only Jesus can save you, and that's the need you have tonight that you need to let him meet. Maybe the Lord's speaking to you, and the question is, are you going to obey the Lord tonight? Are you going to let him have what you have? Whether that be a little bit or be a much. It's all he is. We ought to be good stewards of it. Are you going to let him do what he wants with it? Don't you want to support a missionary? Like these ladies? Take some time to pray. Thank the Lord for providing for you, for helping your faith to grow. Maybe you're not given the faith promise this year, but the Lord's dealing with you about being faithful and tithing or giving something, and, and that's the way you're growing in faith right now. Maybe you're not here yet. That's okay. You start where you're at. If the Lord leads you in two months, you, <laughs> you give. You don't have to give a faith promise card to be, to give to missions and to, to live the faith life here with this giving. Always need to take the next step that the Lord wants you to take. Whatever that is tonight, we sure want you to take it. We're going to pray in a minute, but I'm just giving people opportunity. Now, if you didn't come to pray and you didn't come to give Brother Coulter a faith promise, then and, you, and you're and you going to, you're just waiting, then you can give it to him after the service if you need to. Just wanted to be what the Lord's putting on your heart to do.
there's missionaries that need support. Some of our missionaries need more support. We're trying to get there. Father, thank you for the word today, your word, that liveth and abideth forever. Thank you for these ladies that we've heard about today and tonight. This lady had much, and the lady had little this morning. Thank you that you can use all kind of people, all kind of preachers. We've got all kind of missionaries that we support. Um, there'll be more that you'll put on our heart to support. They're all different. Lord, we're thankful for diversity. And we're thankful for the unity within the diversity in your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the importance that you show us in your word and teach us. That's your heartbeat for souls and missionaries and churches to be started and planted and around this world. And I trust that what we've committed tonight, what we've said that we will do, that we will just keep our eyes upon you and it will cause us to be in your presence more, to trust you. If we don't do it, it won't get done. Um, that we'll find ourselves not only abounding in the grace to give as you have led us, but also in the other areas of our life that we need your grace to abound and meet our needs and guide us. Lord, but as we give, I trust that this will stir our hearts more for the lost here around us, not just for those on the foreign field, uh, but all those who walk around us in darkness, that we would have a burdened and stirred heart for them to come to know you as their Savior. Lord, please do this for us tonight. As you seal these things in our heart, may we rejoice in the coming days which you're going to do through our obedience. And I wonder how much more money you would really want to put through our hands if we could trust you with it. And just uh, do what you tell us to do with it. Lord, teach us to grow that way in our faith. Thank you for speaking to us again. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Till we meet again, take time to know the Lord and to make him known. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God bless.